Good morning, everyone. We're just about ready to get started. So if you could come on in our beautiful new theater and have a seat. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is James Newman. I'm the artistic director of uh, Summer Repertory Theater. Um, and we are here, this is Leslie McCauley, the artistic director and chair of the theater arts department. We are so grateful and happy to welcome you to the renovated Burbank. It has been an incredible journey of four years from door to door, um, and we are happy to have you this morning. Yes. We want to, we were just saying that we feel like it's Thanksgiving and we were throwing all the dirty laundry into the closets before you came. So, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that have changed um, from last night to early this morning here in the, our wonderful building to get ready for this day, so thank yes. you. And now we would like to thank everybody who made this possible, and we want to start with Dr. Chong and the Board of Trustees for choosing this project and making the performing arts a priority for SRJC, and you can see this beautiful facility that we all have now to share today. And we want to thank the architectural firms, Mark Cabanero Associates from San Francisco and TLCD from Santa Rosa, and the project managers, right, uh, sorry, project managers, Harris Associates, and the uh, construction company, Wright, and the theatrical consultants, Shallot Corporation from San Francisco, and the sound consultant, Salter, and countless subs that have worked on this incredibly complex and beautiful building. I think it's, I've been quoting Yates lately and calling, yeah, let's give him a hand. I've been, I've been quoting Yates and calling Burbank a terrible beauty lately because <laughs> performing arts facilities are very, very complex. And that leads us to thank all the incredible people on campus who have been working night and day to make this project happen. We want to thank facilities and custodial and grounds and campus police and media services who are incredible. and anyone else who we've forgotten. And we're so excited to say that starting March 6th, Friday, March 6th, we are having a grand opening here in Burbank, and that is the grand opening weekend. And there's a ribbon cutting at 2 p.m., and then at 7 p.m., 7 to 7.45, we're having a free reception in the lobby of Burbank and offering more tours, backstage tours. So if you didn't get on a tour today, please come Friday, March 6th. That's completely open to the community, so tell your friends. And then at 8 p.m., we're opening our first show, which is The Cripple of Inishman, in our brand new first ever studio theater. A ticket is required for that, and seating is currently quite limited. And then our next, and then music opens on Saturday night, March 7th, with their big performance in here. That is instrumental and choral music combined. And then, from that point on, Burbank is going to be in constant use from April 1st all the way through the next PDA. And by constant use, I mean late Sunday night to early Monday morning. And the next one would be our musical The Wedding Singer, which Theater Arts is producing. That opens April 17th, followed by uh. the dance show. And then we've got the music events, and then we've got the fashion show, and then... Uh, we have our 48th season of Summer Repertory Theater back in our home where we will be producing, yes, thank you. Where we will be producing uh, Evita, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, the musical She Loves Me, uh, and the plays Same Time Next Year and Dirty Blonde. So we will actually be performing simultaneously in both spaces. Um, and actually that is what is going to happen on uh, the opening of the music show as well. Music and Cripple Vanishment will be happening simultaneously in this building. We're overjoyed to have people see our, our incredible student work. And our box office is currently open, and as a special to faculty and staff, next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we are opening the box office from 11.30 to 12 just for SRJC faculty and staff to pick up your tickets. The regular box office hours are from 12 to 4. So without further ado, we want to welcome Vice President of Academic Affairs, Jane Saldana Tally, up to the stage. Thank you, everybody.
Well, as theater people say, welcome to the house. Welcome to SRJC's house. Uh, welcome to spring semester. Um, I'm uh, delighted to have you all here. Um, I want to start out by thanking our colleagues in, on the Petaluma campus for letting us borrow that location for so many um, of our um, PDAs uh, while we renovated this beautiful space. Um, I said this before, that this particular PDA is the one that I most look forward to, and it's because of our Towser lecturer and an opportunity for every one of us at this college to sit in a, in a moment of magic and watch one of our fabulous faculty and for us to be students in that period of time. So often we are on the other side of the educational enterprise and I'm just um, delighted that we're going to be uh, hearing from um, our biological sciences faculty, Sean Brombaugh, this, um, this year. So, um, but with that, um, I am uh, here this morning also to welcome, uh, we have a member of our board of trustees, Maggie Fishman is back there with us and uh, welcome Maggie, thank you for being being here. She is a loyal attendee at um, many of these functions, so we're um, uh, glad to have you here today. And uh, with that, I'm just going to keep it short, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Chong uh, likes to encourage us to do, um, and uh, be brief, be built brilliant, and be seated. And so with that, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, president, Dr. Frank Chong, who's going to make some comments this morning. Thank you. Great job. You stole my that. line. Well, you're going to get to see if uh, I practice what I preach. Welcome back to Burbank Auditorium. What do you think? I told the architects when I met with them, I said, get it right, but the main thing is make sure there's enough women's stalls in the bathrooms. <laughs> and there's 10 stalls. I. I didn't count them myself, Aaron Bricker counted them. So I don't want to see lines in the lobby way. So I'm just so delighted to be here with you today. Um, if you like the seats that you're sitting in, uh, talk to the foundation. Uh, you can get your names or have somebody uh, that you like to name after one of the seats. Uh, and that's part of our fundraising activities for today. And I want to thank everyone, again, who helped recreate this space into a brand new state-of-the-art theater, music, and dance performance venue. I'd like to acknowledge Burbank Auditorium's roots at SRJC and the college's 100 plus years of history. So what we see here is both the old and new elements. The bricks on the outside, which really personifies what SRJC is about. And then inside, the state of the art technology that our faculty, students, and public will enjoy for many years to come. We are long standing, we are steady, and we are strong. But we're also innovative and we welcome new ideas. The building embodies so much of what makes SRJC a place that we're all proud to work. This was made possible because of a collaborative effort of many of you who are here today. And as Burbank Auditorium underwent its renovation, so did our college community. We had the early retirement incentive and 98 retirees were able to now enjoy their long service from the college. I commend this college for all of you, for the ideas, creativity that allowed us to reorganize our institution in a way that made us more efficient, cost effective, while continuing to serve our students in a manner which they deserve. The reorganization has also opened many opportunities for our employees who are staying, and also it will help with our budget situation greatly. And since I came on as president in 2012, I've seen many successes at the college. You all have been working so hard, and when we did our strategic plan in 2014, I don't think we've had a chance to take a breath, reflect, and look back on how much we've actually achieved. So I'm gonna take the rest of my presentation to kind of highlight some of your successes and our successes. So let me see if I can work this thing. Student support services. We had eight objectives and goals that we wanted to set forth in 2014. So you fast forward here now, and you see that students, through the great work of our counseling faculty, have now gone from 42% of our students having educational plans to almost 93%. Let's give our counseling faculty a big round of applause. <laughs> Studies have shown that students who receive educational plans will have a pathway and a roadmap to going to where they want, and they, their time to completion 
will be much shorter so that they're not just drifting around. Uh, we also have new programs that we put together and expansions. The transfer center, we've increased the space of the transfer center on the second floor of Bertolini and it's doubled the number of students who now take place. I really want to thank Amy Merkel and her staff. Our Welcome and Connect Center in Plover Hall, we now have a welcome center for students that are first gen students or new students or re-entry students who want to come in and help them get through the, the myriad of bureaucracy in terms of admissions and financial aid applications and understanding programs. We also have our DRD testing center so that we can have uh, the appropriate testing facilities for our disabled students. And I'm really excited about the program, the Ignite and Second Chance program. The picture you see behind me is a picture of Liz Quiros and Rhonda Finley, one of our faculty members who oversees the program. And this is a program for people who have been incarcerated and transitional programs. And I always say, if it's not for the community college, who else is going to train these folks, these human beings who are returning to society? How are we going to really address the recidivism problem that we have in a society if it were not for programs like this? So let's give them a big round of applause. And when you get down to the bare roots of it, hunger, hunger insecurity, food insecurity. Last year we gave out 100,000 pounds of food distributed last year to our college students and community. We have a grant we're putting in to try to double that for next year. Our financial aid, it costs dough, it costs money to come to college, affordability. We last, from last year, we've increased our Pell Grants by $1.6 million. We've increased our Doyle Awards by $1 million. And for the first time next year, we're going to have Doyle available to part-time students. In the past, it was only available to full-time students. Only 20% of our students are full-time, the other 80% aren't. So now that 80% is going to have equal access to the Doyle Scholarship. And I want to thank the Financial Aid Office and Jana Cox for her leadership. Thank you, Jana. And what we're about, teaching and learning and academic excellence through the leadership of Jane Saldana Talley and Pedro Avila, working together, student services and academic affairs. Our SEA program, we've been able to increase the fall to spring persistence, persistence of our underrepresented students by 23% through services that we have. That's quite significant. In 2019, SRJC graduated more, nearly 50% more students than we did 10 years ago. So you in the classroom, you in the labs, you in the library, you in student services, you're all making a difference. Give yourselves a round of applause. We have the highest acceptance rate to UC campuses of any large community college in the system. 80%. Give yourselves a round of applause. That student there, Johnny Smith, who I owe a lunch to in Berkeley, uh, he's now at Berkeley. He's got a 4.0 average out of coming out of here. Johnny Smith was uh, in jail. He was using drugs. He was stealing from people. SRJC turned his life around, and he's currently at UC Berkeley. Okay? Yeah, that's you. And as you know, besides transfer, we have a very comprehensive career education program. Our completion rates are strong. It provides students an opportunity to receive relevant, hands-on training. We've created a new career hub that connects our students to employers, and it's going gangbusters. Yeah. Diversity, as you know, this is something that's dear and dear to me and all of you in the audience. Uh, we've increased the diversity in our workforce in the last eight years of people of color. Our classified staff has increased from 52% our faculty by 55%, and our management team by 52%. You know, that's quite significant compared to other community colleges. The percentages could be misleading because we started with such a low number, but we're making significant progress. And this year, we're going to be hiring 35 new full-time faculty. That's another opportunity, another bite of the pie to continue to diversify the college, and I challenge you to do that. Thank you. We received the Higher Education in Diversity Award, the only community college in the state of California to receive such an honor. Our LGBTQ Presidential Advisory Committee has been formed. They're very, very active. I was at their hot chocolate thing at 80 degrees yesterday. <laughs> I think next year maybe pina coladas. The Dream Center. Uh, we're one of the first colleges, community colleges to establish a Dream Center. We partner with community-based agencies to give us free legal services to our students. SRJC, through the leadership of the board, uh, was one of the first colleges to designate ourselves as a safe haven for all students. And we're going to maintain our commitment to being open access for all students, regardless of your, your status. 
Okay, our new intercultural center, you're gonna see a video from them. Uh, it's in, in the old Pioneer Hall, and we're just still working on that, and it's coming along quite nicely. You know, we've also expanded our Veterans Center. We've doubled the size of it, and we're serving more veterans who are coming back from Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, and uh, hopefully they will have a, a jump start on, you know, reigniting their careers as they re-enter re the community. Number four, improve facilities and technology. Well, you're sitting here, okay? And that's a picture of, right behind me, our studio theater. We developed a master plan, and we've invested over $22 million in technology using the bond money. So all of your classrooms, all of your labs are being refreshed with the latest equipment and technology throughout the district. As you can see, the Burbank Auditorium. Man, I'm so relieved it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Kundi Hall, you know, many of our math and, and Robert Grand Mason's programs in there doing some wonderful uh, work. It's a beautiful building. The students love it. I've talked to some of the faculty and they really enjoy being in a new facility. Compared to Shuha Hall, it's a very low bar. <laughs> this, is a, this is a picture of their, the math offices. And you guys deserve it. You've been toiling under substandard conditions for so many years and doing your magic. Appreciate it. Athletics, one of my favorite programs. The fields, the athletic fields, the football stadium has been completed, the field. The track will be in this uh, spring. And then we're going to begin the re renovation of the other uh, areas, including an Olympic-sized swimming pool, which is one of its kind in uh, Sonoma County. And uh, Joe McCormick, please get off my ass about that, okay? It's going to get done. <laughs> so we got the, behind you is, uh, you see the new entryway to Petaluma Campus. Uh, that's the new Student Union Center, and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, Matthew Long and Catherine Williams have been working really, really hard on uh, making this happen, and it should be completed by fall of this year. And that's the completion of the Public Safety Center, the mat room, uh, and that was done through a prefab. It was done on time, on budget. Love prefab buildings. Towser Auditorium, one of the oldest buildings on campus. I'm pleased to report that the state just awarded us $9.7 million matching funds to do it, and we're going to transform Towser as we have Burbank. It's going to be great. Yeah. STEM, Lindley Center for STEM Education, going to begin, the, I think the uh, demolition of Shuha should happen around the beginning of summer, and we'll begin construction on that going forward. And that's another rendition. Very kind of modern, Star Wars looking type of building. <laughs> Student housing, a project that we're really, really excited about. Thank you. I think it was this college who, after the fires and even before the fires, started visioning a student housing, 415 beds, five stories, and it's gonna provide much needed housing, affordable housing for our students. I really wanna thank all the faculty, staff, administrators, and students who've worked collaboratively on this project. Okay, this is a, ch a check that we received uh, January 6th from the Department of Commerce, and it was for $7.1 million to help build a construction center in Petaluma campus in order to train Students to go into construction, really good paying job. We're working together with the unions, we're working together with all the construction companies, and it's gonna come up in 24 months. And I wanna thank all the people who have been work, working on that as well, very exciting. Thank you. And this is an area where I have taken a, a saying from Lao Tzu, which is, to lead one must follow. And it's really, I've been following the lead of the faculty, staff, and students who have done such a great job in advocating for greater sustainability on campus. We spent over $26 million so far on sustainability projects. The sustainability committee is doing great work. We hired a wonderful sustainability manager, David Liebman. If you haven't seen him, he's around campus. He's the greatest smart guy. He's, people are trying to steal him from other agencies and I'm trying to keep him from, from interviewing him uh, and keep him happy. And I really want to thank the collaboration with the Associated Students, our student government, we now have SRJC carpool passes, we have transit passes, we have free buses, and we're gonna continue to try to uh, encourage people, and we don't have to do that with uh, Eric Thompson. He rides his bike from Hillsburg, you know? So he's a model of sustainability, you know? And we're moving towards paperless processes across the district. I've really mandated, I've tried to challenge all of the administrative offices to go paperless in two years, you know? So no more of these signed triplicate uh, wasting of trees and killing of trees, okay? <laughs> you 
We've installed solar panels all throughout the campus. We put a geothermal system underneath the football field, and right now it's saving one and a half million dollars a year. Uh, and so I think we're on track to be net energy zero uh, by 2040, and I hope we can exceed that goal and get there sooner. Okay. Cultivate, thank you. And thank you for all who are working on the Sustainability Committee. Creating a healthy organization. You know, we continue to work on safety improvements. Uh, we're working with AFA, the leaders of AFA. They've been very supportive and collaborative in working with us to try to create a safe environment. We have a lock installation project in place. We, we're developing and improving our effective communications. We're trying to work with the faculty and make sure that whatever we put out, you guys look at and provide input before we go out on it. So, and the creation of FIT SRJC. Hey, I don't see my picture on that field. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Aaron Bricker and the work of the FIT SRJC committee, they've really uh, taken that thing by the horns and uh, have yoga classes, different type of classes, uh, free of charge to all of our employees. Great program, thank you. <laughs> Finances, the money, okay? Successful passage measure H, transformative, $410 million. We wouldn't be here without that. The implementation of a long-range plan to retire our deficit and return to fiscal stability. I really want to thank Kate Jolly and the Budget Advisory Committee for their leadership on it. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and we can't do it all by ourselves, relying on the state. So we've hired a wonderful new executive director, Jay Molyneux, uh, who has an ambitious plan, and he's going to really be meeting with all of you, and you should seek him out as well. Jay, would you please stand up and I, so people can see you? Thank you. He's one of the few people in Sonoma County who knows more people than I do. <laughs> Every time I go and say, hey, we hired Jay, as think, oh, I know Jay, worked with him for years. You know, we got lucky with that. Improving institutional effectiveness, last but not least. We're enhancing communication practices. We're trying to become more transparent with a shared understanding and working together and collaboratively. We've established the President's Consultation Council. It's comprised of the leaders, the vice presidents and presidents of all of the constituent groups, students, classified, administrators, the two unions that we work with. And I think it's gone a long way to do rumor control and just be there to talk about what's real and what are the real concerns. And I really appreciate all the members of the PCC for challenging me to be a better president and holding me accountable. And I think it's gone a long way to really rebuilding trust. So thank you, PCC members. Let's give them a big round of applause. I want to continue to foster an environment that encourages and builds trust between all the employee groups. And it comes down to communication, communication, communication. And so uh, please let us know how we can do a better job to communicate with the college community. So let's give ourselves a big round of applause for all we've accomplished since 2014. Thank you. You did it. We did it. And this is a beautiful picture of Schoen Farm on the patio. And as we look forward, I really want to challenge the people in this room to think about as we move into Strategic Plan 2.0, every four or five years you should do one. We're, we're close to six years, so we really need to do a plan. And I looked at the data from Sarah Hopkins from HR. I said, what's the average age of our employees before the ERI? It was 65. I said, post-ERI, what is it? 49. And with the hiring of 35 new faculty, I suspect it's going to continue to go down. And I asked her, how many faculty, staff, and employees and managers were here when I started? And 68% of, um, of the classified have retired or transitioned out since I started eight years ago. 53% of the full-time faculty have transitioned out. And 82% of the managers have transitioned out. I'm a tough guy to work for. 90% were eligible when I arrived, so they're starting to, to, to... So my message to you is, and my appeal to you is, quoting from Aaron Burr in Hamilton, I want to be in the room when it happens. <laughs> so I'm asking you to come into the room and make it happen. And so I really think this is a, an opportunity for us to improve on a great college and make it even better. Uh, and I will close with a video that was produced by our students and it really talks about who belongs at SRJC. Thank you very much. Pre appreciate your, your patience. Thank you. I'm bilingual and I belong. I'm queer and I belong. I'm a white male and I belong. I am indigenous and I belong. I am Asian 
and I belong. I'm international student and I belong. I'm Mexican and I belong. I'm a mujer chingona and I belong. I am African and I belong. I am a Latino with a disability and I belong. I'm a black woman and I belong. We all belong at SRJC. You belong at SRJC. You belong. You belong. You belong. You belong. You belong. You belong. And together, we belong. Wow, what a difference. Welcome, esteemed colleagues. I'm Laura Lynn Larson. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for Faculty, and I also represent the Professional Development Committee. Um, I coordinate this program with Tara Jacobson, who is unable to be here today. Many of you have uh, completed a degree or certificate within the last year, or will be doing so this May. And if you are one of those who have completed a degree, either here or elsewhere, would you please stand and be acknowledged? Please stand, don't be shy. No, no, stand. Stay standing. Thank you. I want to share a few of the faculty professional development highlights. A statewide um, colleague was visiting Tara and I recently, and she was amazed at how many workshops and um, activities we have for faculty in order to, and, and all of staff for our professional development. And she said it is unprecedented in the state. There are very few that have as many offerings as we do. And that is because of all of you offering your expertise. So I just want to thank you and encourage you to keep doing it. Thank you. As Dr. Chong mentioned, we have, currently we have five um, new faculty. Next year we will have 35 new faculty coming. And we are currently recruiting for communities of practice for next year's cohort. So this is an opportunity for all of you to share your expertise in a more in-depth way in the spring semester of 2021. If you are interested in offering your um, pedagogical practices, please contact Tara and I and we will help you put that together. Uh, in March and April is uh, Faculty Appreciative Observation. This is an opportunity for you as faculty to open up your classrooms and invite other faculty to come and observe. It's a great opportunity for learning. And if you haven't signed up yet, please respond to our emails as they go out. We continue to work collegially with Professional Development Committee on campus-wide activities. Thank you, dedicated PDC members who are here. Thank you. And now the reason we are all here, the history of the Towser Lecture. Brooke Towser was a faculty lecturer, is, is, highlighted, uh, is the highlight of the PDA Day each spring, and an honor for the faculty member who is selected to give it. The Towser Lecture is a longtime Santa Rosa JC tradition since 1987, named in honor of Brooke Towser who is an emeritus professor of history and the former vice president of academic affairs at Santa Rosa JC. Brooke was the first VP of instruction and in fact, the first vice president of anything at Santa Rosa JC. He worked at the college from 1955 through 1986 and frequently taught classes through his career. While working in the Office of Instruction, Brooke collaborated with a group of originators who are responsible for the beginning and establishment of both the Petaluma campus and Schoen Farm. Even after retiring, he authored two volumes set of Santa Rosa JC history covering the period from 1957 to 2000. Brooke is cherished for his warmth, integrity, and dedication to academic excellence. Here to introduce this year's lecture is Heidi Sala, last year's recipient of the Towser Lecture Award. Heidi. Good, mor good morning, everybody. Good morning. So exciting not to give the lecture this time. 
Spring is all about renewal, and I'm thrilled to introduce the new 2020 Towser lecturer, Dr. Sean Brumbaugh, from the Life Sciences Department. We're in for a big treat this morning, but before we begin, I'd like to take some time to share some interesting facts about our esteemed colleague. I can read you an impressive CV, like how he got his Bachelor's of Science degree in Conservation and Resource Studies at UC Berkeley, and his PhD in Biological Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin, but I'd rather share some good stories and fun facts about him. <laughs> so first, Sean didn't plan on becoming a biology professor. He actually wanted to be a professional soccer player when he grew up. Um, he was an active and outdoorsy young man, and he couldn't imagine a life cooped up behind a desk. According to him, he was actually on two trajectories in life. He was going to either play pro soccer, or he was going to become a park ranger. So I think in some ways both of his dreams did come true, and I'll explain. He's a major team player. He's working as an AFA council member who needs a soccer team, right? Like, that's enough. Um, and he may not be a park ranger, but he regularly takes his students and family on field trips to teach them how to understand and value all forms of life. In my opinion, he's actually in a position where he can affect more change and make a greater impact as a teacher. So, Sean, it worked out just fine. In getting to know Sean, there's one story that stood out, me, out to me and highlighted his passion for the study of living things and his compassion for all creatures, no matter how big or small. During his undergraduate studies at Cal, he went on a field trip to Tilden Park as part of his natural history of vertebrates class. He recalls that day was particularly cold and rainy, and he was assigned to observe and journal the behavior of these cute little towhee birds around him. He had to do this for four hours on a chilling day, and he sat there in the cold watching these birds closely and marking their every move. After the field trip was over, he felt relieved to be the comfort and warmth of food and shelter, but he couldn't stop thinking about those birds still out there. He realized in the moment the fragility of life and how in an effort to survive, and I quote him, all organisms are on the cusp of death, unquote. But he didn't look at this scenario morbidly, but rather he wanted to make sure that he and all of us always took the opportunity to admire and study the natural world. He told me to see really cool stuff, make sure you go out on rainy, cold days and not just the beautiful, sunny ones. And now for a random list of fun facts, and they are totally random. Um, about Sean. First, he grew up in Santa Rosa. Did you know he went to Santa Rosa High School? I know, it's exciting. He's the youngest of three, so he's the youngest in the photo. This guy. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. This is his first day of kindergarten, and his favorite subject when he was a kid was, quote, recess, end of quote. I love that. He traveled a good portion of the world as a seven, eight-year-old. He was in Africa, Europe, and the Pacific. And this is my favorite fact, probably. He lived on Lizard Island in the Great Barrier Reef. He's sitting in a giant shell. What a childhood. And I had to put the picture with the mullet, because come on. <laughs> Because why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> he started college as an economics major. So it's been a long trajectory to getting him here um, in biology. But he did come from a long line of biologists. And so it seems to be a family trait. Yet he has a very strong fear of snakes. So keep that in mind. He's actually related to Berkeley's bubble lady, so if anyone knows her, there's a fun story. We don't have time for it, but um, going along with that, he loves 
to ride his sweet VW van all around the country. He is guilty of photobombing a Sunset Magazine photo shoot. He's not supposed to be in that photo. <laughs> I thought that was great. He met the love of his life in a donut shop. She is. And you may recognize that this love of his life is none other than our own SRJC Health Sciences instructor, Jennifer Richardson. This is another talent of Sean's that just blew me away. Look at this. He bakes beautiful cakes. <laughs> Only for his daughters. But they're gorgeous and they're all kind of, you know, oceanic themes almost, right? There's a pattern. Um, here's a great family photo. His daughter Zoe and Katie Jo, who are here in the front row. They put up with their dad, quote, dictating and making us go out to nature. <laughs> In closing, I'd like to add that Sean is truly a product of art and science. No, literally. His mom was an artist and his dad was a biology professor, so. <laughs> he grew up looking at natural forms and noting what a perfect balance there was between function and beauty. And his wife, Jennifer, has a degree in art history, so, as well as nursing. So he's really comfortable being in both of these worlds. To Sean, where he lives is more important than what he does. And he has a genuine love and appreciation for the spectacular ecosystem that we live in here in Sonoma County. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our 2020 Towser lecturer, Dr. Sean Brumbaugh. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Heidi. Um, that wasn't as bad as I was fearing. <laughs> uh, it could have been a lot worse, especially the mullet pictures. Uh, that was one of the better ones. Uh, and thank you for the, the Towser Committee. It is, it is truly an honor to be given the privilege to spend an hour with you and to talk about something that I love. Uh, I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be to pick a topic. To, I mean, if you think about it, you have one hour to distill what you love and to try to communicate that to others. And it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. People were helping me out with all kinds of advice, and it all seemed to come to the same thing. Talk about what you love. And that made perfect sense. Uh, and so I thought about how I might be able to pull off a full hour lecture on donuts, <laughs> titled The New Superfood. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tammy. <laughs> and um, that wouldn't fill up an hour. But so I was tossing around a few other ideas and realized that that the Kincaid fires in the fall kind of pointed me in a new direction. And so what, what those fires did, it was just another blow in a sequence of blows over several years. And it brought a level of despair, I think, to our community that I had never experienced before, I'd never heard. For the first time, I was hearing people talking about, I need to leave Sonoma County. I need to get out of California. And, and as a native to this area, as someone who was born and raised in Santa Rosa, and um, I started to, to feel a little hurt by that. It was, it was a strange experience on how I became very protective and defensive um, about that. And so I felt like I wanted to speak out on behalf of this state and this county for many reasons, but especially because of the natural beauty that we've been gifted in living here. So that became the focus of my talk. Um, before I move on, I, I did not want to, to, to pay tribute to my parents. Uh, they took me to, and my siblings to amazing places in the world. We've seen amazing things. I've been very privileged. But the, I think the biggest gift that they gave me and my siblings was how to see everyday common little things as beautiful. 
And so that every time I'm walking around, there's always an opportunity to take notice of something and see something beautiful. And so that's what I'm hoping that this talk will do for you, that I can communicate that to you. So that even just a, a walk across campus will give you pause and appreciation for where we live. All right? Okay, so I love California. I, I, I'm not going to apologize. I love California. And I will, I will defend it and I will argue with anyone who says otherwise that it's not the, one of the, it's not, it's the best place in the country. <laughs> so, thank you. And I'm biased. I mean, it's an opinion. But as an ecologist, I feel like I can actually kind of back it up a little bit. That I'm going to scroll through some photos here. I'm just going to kind of get, let you watch some of these and take in the variation of ecosystems that this state has to offer. These are just a few of my favorite places that I've been to and hope to keep going back to. We have the opportunity to see the oldest trees on the planet in California. We can see the largest trees on the planet. Turns out they aren't the largest organisms anymore. They think it's a fungus, but. So if we think about what you can see in a day's drive, starting, if you wanted to drive the length of the state, you could start in deserts. And, and actually, California has three different types of deserts. So you can pick one. And by the end of the day, you can find yourself in temperate rainforest in the northwestern part of the state. That is remarkable. Or if you wanted a shorter drive, you could drive across the state. And you could start with this, the, the rocky coastline of Sonoma County. And within a handful of hours, you could be in high elevation alpine meadows surrounded by granite peaks. This is a remarkable thing that is unprecedented by, you know, by any other place in the country of even comparable size. So what is it that's so special about California? Well, I'm not the only person that thinks that California is a really special, unique place. There's this organization, Conservation International, which kind of tracks and monitors biodiversity across the planet and tries to highlight particularly unique places on, this, on, on the globe for their biological uniqueness. And California is one of the 34 places that have been identified. Now, it's actually called the California Floristic Province. And it includes most of California. About 70% of California is in this region. And it does include a little bit of Oregon when we get up to the tip. And let me zoom in here. And actually extends down into Baja, California. But most of California is in this region. And what characterizes it as a biologically unique region is the high number of species that are only found in California or in this province and nowhere else in the world. And unfortunately for California, many of these are also threatened and endangered because of urban expansion. So why is California so diverse? What is it that contributes to all this biological diversity? Well, it kind of starts with the soils. And I do want to give a shout out to Rebecca Proroth because everything I know about geology, I learned from her. Um, and if you have an opportunity to ever take any class with Rebecca, please do so. Um, so each of these different colors is a different soil type. And California, because of its dynamic geology, allows for the mixing and the mashing of all kinds of different sediments. And, 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 and it allows for, it, to me, this looks like, an, like a crayon box exploded. And so each of these have different mineral properties, other soil properties, which support different types of plant communities. But California, it's a long state. And this long latitudinal range also gives it um, a lot of variation in its climate from the south part of the state to the northern part of the state. So starting in the southern part, we have warmer and drier conditions. And as you move further north, it becomes milder and wetter. So we have that sort of a gradient. 
We also have a really long coastline. And what this does is it gives us a maritime climate right along the coast, which maintains those regions as being very mild year round. But as we move inland, those temperatures become more extreme, both hotter and colder. And then, really, it's the effect of mountains kind of affect this interesting gradient in precipitation patterns across the state. California, we have two coastal ranges that run parallel to the coast. And the reason why that's important is that as wind patterns come off the Pacific, they hit these mountains and they rise up. And whenever they rise up, they form rain. And then they fall back down on the other side, and that actually results in dry zones. So that is the reason why the coastal mountains here are green and wet, and the Central Valley is dry. This is a process which is referred to as a rain shadow effect. But then there's a second mountain range where air masses will rise up and produce lots of precipitation, and then dry zones on the downwind side. And in fact, the entire Great Basin is a desert because of the Sierra Nevada. It's a big rain shadow effect. But this allows us to have these zones across the state of wet, dry, wet, dry, along with these gradients in warmer to colder. So this is where we get all of our unique microclimates from that support all kinds of unique um, assemblages of species. This is really weird for me because I'm so used to asking, like, anyone have any questions? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't have time for that, so talk to me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so we can see the effect of some of these gradients on two of our common oak species. And um, I, I know very little about oaks, but everything I know about oaks I learned from Steve Barnhart, so I do want to acknowledge Steve as, as the, the local expert on oaks. So um, we have the Oregon oak, and the Oregon oak is found further north, coming out of, of Washington into Oregon into northern California. And the coast live oak is restricted to the southern portion of the coastal range, and though it's also in the central part of the state. And if we look right there, that is where Sonoma County is. And Sonoma County is where the ranges of these two, organisms, or these two species overlap. And so what we are is we're really in a biological crossroads. We capture some of those species that are further north, we capture some of those species that are better suited for the southern sort of climates. And this is a region where some of those are able to coexist with each other. And so we actually even just live in a very special part of, Sonoma, or of California. So now let's just kind of zoom in on Sonoma County, and this is where we'll kind of focus our time. So we have our mountains here. We have our valleys over here. There's a low point right here, and this is our Petaluma Wind Gap. And this creates a tremendous amount of variation in precipitation patterns within our own county. And so if we just look at these few areas, and they're just actually a few miles apart as the crow flies, so to speak, if we were to draw a straight line on a map. I think it's something like only 20 miles from Santa Rosa to Venado, which is just north of Guerneville. But if we look at the amount of annual precipitation that these regions receive, wow. I mean, these areas in these hills are receiving about twice the rainfall of what we have in the southern part of the county. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> if you grew up in this area in the 70s, along with bell bottoms and feathered hair, <laughs> we had Christos Fence. This was a remarkable thing. I didn't appreciate it at the time. But this is an 18-foot wall. Well, first off, this was completed in 1976. It was an 18-foot fence made of shiny white nylon that billowed in the wind. And it literally ran out of the Pacific Ocean. It emerged kind of magically out of the Pacific, right between um, Tomales and Bodega Bays. And it ran for approximately 25 miles um, across the county. And I remember as a kid, we got loaded up in the car. The parents were like, we're going to go see the fence. Because <laughs> everyone thought that this was crazy, and like, I, we have to go see it. And we did, and we all stood there kind of speechless. This, this transformed me. I didn't appreciate it as, as a nine-year-old. But this has stuck with me. When I still look at these West County Hills, I think of that fence, because it transformed the way I see these things. It, 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 it provided a fluidity to the landscape. And it, and it kind of, I think what it did is it, it helped me imagine the relationship between land and wind. And so I thought that this was actually appropriate for my talk. 
This is it showing the fence coming out of the ocean right here and zigzagging. Valley Ford is right there, and it zigzagged across, actually all the way over to 101. So what I want to do with my talk, I decided, is we're going to start at the coast, and we're going to travel inland, and we're going to visit three kind of iconic ecosystems that characterize Sonoma County. We're first going to talk about the Rocky Intertidal, and then we're going to talk about redwoods, and then we're going to talk about oak woodlands as we move inland. Now, each of these topics in their own right deserves a whole separate lecture, if not a whole separate semester-long course. So I can give it 10 minutes. So imagine, but my objective is not to teach you a lot about these things, but it's to give you enough little sort of stories, some type of story that you will grab your interest. And so the next time you're in these places, you'll kind of stop and pause and maybe look down or look up or look around and see it in a different way. Okay? All right, so let's start with the Rocky Intertidal. So this is a Bodega Head looking north. Um, and we are also fortunate to have these events called these nutrient upwellings. So we receive these, during periods of the year, there are these pulses of, of deep water that get pushed up to the surface, transporting all kinds of nutrients. And those are being shown here by all of the green swirls. Those are that's the result of nutrients leading to kind of a, a bloom of algae. And we can see that. So our coastline, supports some of the more productive systems on the planet as a result of these nutrient upwelling events. And that then adds into the diversity of organisms that we see in the rocky intertidal. Now, by the intertidal, what we mean is that region that is exposed at low tide and then submerged at high tide, so between the tides. And so this is showing areas that are now exposed at low tide but it still allows for little pools to remain where we actually can have a look in. These cycles happen twice a day, so they're these kind of these temporary windows that we have access to these, um, to these systems. Now, there's many organisms in here that will come and go. You go out there one day, you'll see them. Go out there another, they're hard to find. They're transitional, but there's other organisms that you will always see out there. And so, I encourage you, go out there, poke around, have a look, pick things up. There's nothing out there that's going to really hurt you. Um, but, but tread lightly. If you are picking things up, put them back gently, this sort of thing. But these are good places to explore because they're like treasure hunts for me. You just get out there on your hands and knees and you lift things up and you're looking for things and you never know what you're going to find. Well, one of the things you will find are barnacles. Now, many people are surprised to actually learn what barnacles are. Barnacles are crustaceans. They're closely, they're in the same group as crabs and shrimp and lobster. They don't look like it. But this is what we see when, we're, when they're out of water. They're kind of protecting themselves from drying out. But when they're larvae, they look like that. They do look shrimp-like, and what they do is they swim around and then ultimately they attach themselves, they glue themselves on their head to some rock. And then they rapidly transform into the barnacle that we know. So the best way to, to, to describe a barnacle was actually described by Louis Agassiz, who is, is a very noted zoologist, and I love this description, that they're nothing more than a little shrimp-like animal standing on its head in a limestone house and kicking food into its mouth. But we don't really get to appreciate this and we actually look into these pools and see these organisms. And this is what kicking food into their mouth looks like. And isn't that beautiful? These frilly little structures coming out are their legs. They're modifications of their legs for capturing food. And then they capture that food and they pull it in and they rub it off onto their mouth. It's really, and they do this pulsing thing. So it almost looks like a pulsing of flowers opening up over and over and over again. Now, there are lots and lots of sea anemones, and you will always see these. And these are the aggregating sea anemones, and they form these kind of large colonies of individuals. It's hard to appreciate how beautiful these organisms are when they're out of water, because they kind of look like a gelatinous blob. They kind of look like that, which is kind of beautiful in its own way. But when they're underwater and they're open up, 
it looked like this. It's almost like a bouquet of flowers opening up. Now, these are animals. They're in the same group as jellies and corals. And they're predators. And they sit and wait for things to touch them. And so what they do is they have these tentacles. And on those tentacles, they're lined with all, kind, with all of these stinging cells. In essence, when they're touched, it triggers this harpoon-like structure to eject out at the speed of a, of a bullet being shot out of a pistol. And thousands of these line their tentacles. And so go ahead and touch them. <laughs> it's okay. These actually, the ones here won't hurt you. But they'll feel sticky. You can actually, they'll kind of reach and they'll grab onto your finger. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to put your finger into their mouth <laughs> where there's a digestive cavity there that has really strong digestive enzymes. So it's okay to touch them, but don't let it put your finger in its mouth. Because <laughs> if you let it sit there for a little while, it'll come out looking really different. <laughs> All right. So, and this is just an image showing what some of these little harpoons look like as they shoot out. They're really, really terrifying looking. And, and I think if you're a smaller organism, they are. And these don't hurt us because our, th our skin is too thick for them to penetrate through. So, all right, now, these. These are in the same group of animals as those sea anemones. But oftentimes people think that these are just kind of plants. You'll see these washed up onto the beach all the time. But what these are is a colony of thousands and thousands of little animals. And if we look on those little filaments, we see all kinds of little notches, and you may be able to see that there's this little fuzzy thing right here. Those little fuzzy things are like tiny little sea anemones. So this is actually a colony of thousands and thousands and thousands of these little organisms. And on their tentacles, like those sea anemones, they have these shooting sort of harpoons that they use to capture their prey. Now I'm gonna come back to these because there's a fun story about another organism that ties into these. Now, who doesn't love a good gumboot chitin? <laughs> I love these. They're, they can be about the size of like a, a small football. And they're kind of like an abalone. If you were to pick one of these up, and this is one of my daughters who didn't want me to show her face. Um, <laughs> this is what they look like on the underside. And they have these beautiful, so big, bright orange or yellowish um, kind of foot that they use. So they move like a, they're, they're closely related to snails. We can think of them as a big snail. And they're kind of fun because if you hold it for a while, it'll curl up into a ball like a pill bug does. And so it's kind of fun to watch them do that. Now, most people I know who study invertebrates in the rocky intertidal, if you ask them what their favorite organism is, is most of them will say, at least that I know, the nudibranchs. And nudibranchs are sea slugs. So these are slugs, but live in the ocean. And these are some of the most beautiful creatures on the planet. This is, this is one of my daughter's favorites. Um, this has an interesting sort of story with it. Um, I'd been going out for years and years and years with my dad, and I don't ever recall seeing that. And it, and it started to show up more and more on our local beaches, or our local tide pools. This is a, a species that is typically more commonly found in the central coast and up into the Monterey Bay area. But it's appearing more here, and this seems to be one of these indicator species that's suggesting shifting warming climates up into this region, possibly as a consequence of climate change. It's a beautiful, beautiful, the first time I saw it, I thought someone had thrown out their, their bubble gum. And I'm like, what's that? Someone, dang litterers, so. <laughs> but, but it's these beautiful, beautiful nudibranchs. Now, you'll also notice that many of these are brightly colored. Oftentimes when animals are brightly colored, it suggests that they're not to be messed with. And this nudibranch is not to be messed with because of what it feeds on. It feeds on these ostrich plume hydroids. And remember, they have these little animals that live inside of them that shoot out these stinging cells. 
Well, it turns out they're able to consume these. They feed on these animals. And not only do those harpoon-like structures not get shot out, they actually are able to store those cells inside of these little feathery structures so that if some fish comes along, they get a mouthful of these exploding little harpoons. Cool strategy. Okay. Now, if you're walking along the beach, you pick up a shell, sometimes you'll see that it has a little hole in it. Where does that come from? It looks like someone drilled it for a necklace and just left it, let it go, I'll forget it. Well, it actually comes from a snail. There are many snails that do this. The moon snail is one of these. And s mollusks, which include snails and slugs and so on, have a, a feeding structure, which is described as a rasping tongue. And they use it to scrape off algae. Um, or in some cases, they can use it as a drill, to drill through the hard parts of shells. There is an interesting recent discovery uh, that one of the radulas of one of the groups of snails is thought to produce the strongest biological material that we know of. Okay. And you may even see an octopus. These are really hard to find. And it's because they can change colors almost immediately and blend themselves in. And this particular one is pretty small. And so if you do find these, you can actually, you can pick them up, you can handle them, be very gentle with them, put it right back to where you got it, but you do need to be careful that it's not really gonna come off until it wants to. <laughs> it's on its terms, not yours, necessarily. <laughs> and they can leave a little bite, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> All right, so one of the things I try to encourage students to, to, to see is, is patterns. And in these systems, we can oftentimes see wonderful patterns. And here we can see that these darker things up here are muscle beds. And down below in these lower areas is a whole assemblage of all kinds of different algae. And there's all kinds of other animals that are living there as well. Well, it turns out that all of these organisms that exist in this system, the assemblage of these species, are strongly influenced by one species. And that led to the development of what we describe as a keystone species. And keystone species are really important. This is one of the more important sort of revelations in ecology. Um, and it was developed, it was kind of described in the 1960s. And the whole concept of a keystone species is based on the role of this one organism in this system. And what a keystone species is, it's a species with a particularly large influence on the overall assemblage of, of organisms in that system, even though they are somewhat, they are not very abundant. They don't make up very much of the biological material, but they strongly influence the assemblage of species there. So this is gonna be a little, little, little test. Which of these do you think is the keystone species in this system? Do a little <laughs> think pair share. <laughs> several of these, there are several keystone species in here. But the first key described keystone species, what the whole concept was based on, and colleagues in my department, you can't, you can't play. <laughs> well, it's a sea star. People are really surprised that sea stars are top predators in these systems. And if it were not for the sea stars, these mussels would invade these rocks. Mussels are very good at dominating space. And if you don't have something constantly removing them, they will march down. And some of these early studies showed that if you don't have sea stars in these systems, you lose about 90% of the species assemblage. So, now, how do sea stars feed? I think it's important when you go out there to have an appreciation for this because it is, it is so fabulous. It is really cool. So, they have these tube feet. They use these tube feet to attach onto the two shells of a mussel. And then, with these tube feet, they're able to kind of gently pry it open. I guess it's not gentle from the mussel's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> and so, they just need to open it just enough, and then they're able to take their stomach and squeeze it out of their body and into, in between that space, into the muscles and actually surround the muscle flesh. 
where they then will spray digestive enzymes on it, turn it into a soup, and slurp it up. <laughs> so to really appreciate this, you need to see this in action. This is really sped up, because if we were just watching these in real we'd be here all day. seeing here is the stomach actually this is a camera inside of the muscle shell and here comes the stomach So the next time that you see an open muscle shell, it's very likely that that was the victim of a sea star. I, I think that that's beautiful, but my, my wife does not. <laughs> it kind of freaked her out. <laughs> so, all right. So, now we're gonna leave these tide pools and now we're gonna move inland. And our next stop are gonna be the coastal redwoods. So, we live in a really special part of the world because we have access to these trees. And these are world-renowned. People come here from all over the world to see these trees. Now, we live right here. Here's Sonoma County. And this area in green is showing the main distribution of the coastal redwoods. They start right up here at the Oregon-California border. Just, they go a couple miles into Oregon, but not enough where Oregon can honestly claim them as their own. And they extend south into Sonoma County as the main distribution. And so sometimes you'll hear the reference that we are the gateway to the, to the Redwood Empire because we are the gateway to this kind of continuous distribution. There's other pockets of Redwoods over here in Napa and down in Marin and in the peninsula. And then the southernmost limit is Big Sur. So what is so famous about these trees? These are the tallest trees on the planet over 380 feet tall, possibly. Imagine one of these trees at the end line of the football field falling over and the top would still expand beyond the other end zone. These are enormous organisms. Now, part of what restricts them to this range is the presence of summer fog. They need a constant supply of water all year round. And in our summers, we don't get measurable precipitation, and so they rely on the presence of fog. And they're actually designed to catch fog. Sometimes they're referred to as fog catchers. And their needles are kind of have a, a unique arrangement for conifers, the needle-bearing plants. And that if we think about a Christmas tree, most of the needles are arranged in all the way around the branch. But redwoods, the needles come off, at right in, or come off on opposite sides of the branch. And what this does, it kind of creates a, a larger, flatter surface. And so this allows for more surface area for fog to condense on and then drip off. And this is referred to as fog drip. And if you go into a redwood forest on a really foggy afternoon or evening, it actually sounds like it's raining in there. There's this drip, 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 drip. And they've actually calculated about 40% of all the water in some places actually of redwood forests rely on this fog drip as their means of precipitation. Now, we have a long history of logging in this county. Redwood wood is spectacular building material. And these forests have been logged extensively numerous times. The first time that they were, the first big wave of logging was with the gold rush. And then the second big wave for the Bay Area was after the 1906 earthquake. And these forests held monsters. 
I can't even imagine what it was like when these big trees came down. I've got to think it must have been one of the most dangerous jobs on the planet to be in here when these things came down. Now, this is showing kind of the extent of our logging. This is Guerneville in 1911. And Guerneville at that time had the nickname of Stumptown. And if you look on these hills, there's really no large tree remaining. Everything had been stripped out. Now, since then, these forests have recovered. And this is what we see now. This is Mono Rio, which is just a few miles down the road. And these are mostly redwoods. But what we have to imagine when we visit these forests is what they used to be like. This is what we have now. This is what there used to be in these forests. Magnificent places. Now, we are fortunate to have some places where we can still see these remaining giants. Armstrong Redwoods is one of these places. I would encourage you all, if you haven't been to Redwood National Park or Prairie Creek um, National Park or Humboldt State Park, go up there where we can see larger forests, collections of these huge giants. Now, when I visit these places, it's, it's to find solitude. There's a quietness to it. There's kind of a smell. We enjoy the lushness. And when I took plant ecology classes, and we'd go out to these redwoods, we would talk about all the things here on the forest floor. However, we were completely ignoring the other half of the story. And it wasn't until the 1990s, that with some extraordinary efforts of a few people, that we started to figure out there's a whole other element to these forests that we were ignoring. So when people started climbing these trees, we had all kinds of new understanding of these forests. So what they were finding, they actually started to map some of these out. They would go up and they would measure the size of the branches and the number of branches and the angles they were coming off. And what they realized is that these are some of the most complex trees on the planet. That was, that's, I think, a phenomenal revelation that took to the 1990s to discover. All right, so this is actually showing what we have here. These are these huge branches that are coming off, and they've actually shown that these are some of the most structurally complex trees on the planet. And between all of these little sort of branching points, these are so enormous that these are places where leaf litter can deposit, and, and then they start to break down, and they establish a soil base. And in that soil, all kinds of plants will grow. And there's a whole secondary forest that's just up into the canopy that we have completely ignored because all of our attention was on the ground. And so these plants are called epiphytes, literally meaning surface plants. So these live on the surface of other things. And so let's see what some of the discoveries were. And so these are the numbers I'm going to show you from a paper that was published a few years ago, looking at the diversity of plants and, and lichens um, up in these canopies of an old growth redwood forest. And so these are showing these kind of lightish, yellowish, green things are lichens. And in total, they counted 183 different species in this one little tract of forest. Now, what a lichen is, it's not a plant. It's actually a partnership. It's a partnership between algae, the green things, and fungus, the little thread-like things. And the algae do photosynthesis to provide the fungus with sugars and the fungus wraps its filaments around to form a fabric 
around those, which protects them from drying out. There, see, Robin, I do love fungi. <laughs> <laughs> So, what else were they finding? Well, they discovered 50 different species of mosses. And mosses are simple plants, and they're kind of the darker green fuzzy stuff, but 50 different species of those. And then they're also finding many species of ferns and conifers and flowering plants, 49 different species. So these include ferns, but it also included things like huckleberry bushes, bay trees, other redwood trees growing on redwood trees. It's really a remarkable place. And they're also discovering, well, actually, here we go. In total, we need the total, 282 different epiphyte species living up there in these little islands in the sky. All right. But it's not all just about the plants. They're also making some interesting discoveries about animals. And one of those is this creature. This is the wandering salamander. This lives on the forest floor, but they're also finding it 200, 250 feet up in these little fern and moss mats. How it got up there, they're not sure. And they would find that actually you would have a dozen or more of these inhabiting a single large fern mat. And they think they may actually even be reproducing with other salamanders in other trees, but they have no idea how this happens. But they're now kind of speculating, suggesting that maybe these should be considered separate species because they seem to be just fulfilling a unique ecological role that's different than their counterparts on the ground. But I think the biggest surprise were these things. The copepod. These, we could think of them as, as freshwater shrimp. And they were finding these at hundreds of feet in the air. Now these will occupy, also occupy, in addition to these kind of, uh, these streams that go through these redwood forests, they also inhabit some of the moist soil. But how these organisms got up into those trees, we don't really know. There's lots of interesting sort of conjecture, some fun stories. Some say they were carried up there on bird's feet. There's others that actually have proposed that they swam up there during heavy rainfall events, that there's enough water that trickles down through the bark, and these things may be able to, over the course of a long period of time, swim their way up. But we don't know. Okay, so, what this is about is next time you're in these forests, pause, look up, think about what else is up there. How did those shrimp get there? <laughs> so, all right, so now, our last system, we're going to talk about the oak woodlands moving inland. And so this is um, a an 1876 map of Santa Rosa. And this is the Santa Rosa Plain. And we see that at this time, it was dotted with these giant oaks. And these were valley oaks. Anyone want to guess what, what, what's there now? That's our future campus. And you'll see we have lots of these giant oaks. And in fact, many of the oaks that we have on this campus now may have been 50, 100 years old at the time that this map was created. They may be on this map. Now, this region has undergone a lot of change. This is an, a, a photo looking down into the same Santa Rosa Plain um, from Taylor Mountain. And this was taken in 1965. And what we can see is most of those trees are gone and they've been uh, removed for the conversion of agriculture. And since 18, 1965, this has basically been filled in with um, urban expansion. But we do still have some remaining remnants of these systems on our campus. We are uh, one of these last remaining sort of valley oak communities. And we can experience this just by walking across campus. So, we're probably all familiar with the galls. This is a California oak gall. But some people are surprised to learn where these galls come from. They come from these, the California oak gall wasp. And what the female will do is she lays her eggs inside of an oak branch. And chemicals released from that actually stimulate cell growth of the oak around those eggs. 
and those will house those eggs where they then will protect and feed the larvae throughout much of their life. And eventually, these larvae will emerge into adult wasps and they dig their way out. And so this is looking at one of these kind of, not in the dried state, but in its kind of green lush state. So, and if you were to cut this open, you would see these really cute little wasp larvae. Aren't these beautiful? I mean, this one even looks like it's smiling. <laughs> now, we're probably more familiar with it in its dried state after it's done its job. And you may notice that there are actually these holes on them. And what are those holes? The exit points for the mature wasps. And this is where the mature wasps will emerge and then fly off to repeat this cycle again somewhere else. But these aren't the only type of galls. Oaks support a, a rich assemblage of different um, galling wasps like the crystalline gall. The spine turbine gall, or the hedgehog gall. You can see all of these by walking around campus and just looking at the leaves more closely. The red cone gall. In each of these, if you were to look inside, you'd find a little baby wasp. All right. This is the part of my talk where I was going to title it Dew Drops and Ass Lickers. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it'll make sense in, in a little bit. Trust me. <laughs> so if you park your car somewhere on campus, you'll notice that sometimes you get all these little sticky droplets on it. And those are honeydew drops. Well, where do those come from? They come from aphids. Aphids have this piercing mouth part that they'll stick into a plant and then they suck out the sugar-rich juices. And then, oftentimes, those little sugary juices come out of the other end. <laughs> so think about that next time when your car is covered with all these little sugary drops. <laughs> but that is good stuff. <laughs> it's sugar water. Why not take advantage of it? And that's what ants do. So you may also see that these plants, where we see a lot of these aphids, are covered with aphids, or covered with ants. Well, let's have a look what they're actually doing. So here we see an, an aphid feeding. And here it comes. So now you know why that all made sense. It's, it's, it's biologically accurate. So I actually want to see that again. We need to watch it in slow motion. And actually what the ant is doing, you can see it's tickling the abdomen of the aphid and that stimulates it to release its drop for it. This is actually a process which is called milking. It's not that different than what we do with cattle for milk. Now, this actually benefits the aphids because the ants are their bodyguards. And the ants then defend those aphids against other predators like ladybird beetles. So this is a beneficial relationship for the two. The ants get food and the aphids get protection. Okay, now, let's turn our attention up into the trees of this campus. If you walk across this campus, this should be a familiar sound, and if it's not, I hope it will become one. These are sounds that echo through the oak woodlands throughout California. So let's have an appreciation for what is producing those calls. Thank <laughs> you. 
So these beautiful birds are acorn woodpeckers. And they're unique for a number of things, but one of them is these acorn granaries that they create. These granaries can be huge. Some of them can be 50,000 acorns that are stored in these holes. Each one of these holes takes about 20 minutes for them to excavate and make. So it's a tremendous amount of investment of energy and time. They have to do that because they, each of these holes is tailor fit for a specific acorn because it needs to be snug enough in that hole that squirrels don't steal them. And these are caches of extra food for them. These, acorn, or these woodpeckers primarily feed on insects, but these are backup food supplies for them. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about these is their social structure. They're really unique for birds. And you may have noticed that when you're on campus, you see a whole bunch of them around a common nest hole. And we'll see their nest holes in trees all over campus. And they like to live in these dead cavities. And you'll see many birds coming in and out and interacting with each other. Well, it turns out that this is a single family unit occupying that nest. And it's thought that they need these large family units to maintain these granaries. They're so work intensive. And in, the in 1925, a paper was published, and they <laughs> described this, remember it's 1920s, described this as communism <laughs> in, these, in these woodpeckers which seems a little funny now, but... Well, let's look at the social structure of these nests. Many individuals coming and going. And when they study these, they find that they're occupied by numerous males and numerous females. So the M's here represent the males, and the Fs represent the females. And one of the interesting things about these birds is all of the, ma all the males are related to each other. All the females are related to each other. But the males and females are not related to each other. They're distant. And they all lay their eggs in a common nest. And they cooperate in the care of each other's offspring, which they're ultimately all related to somehow. Either a chick is their direct offspring, or it's a niece or a nephew, or some type like that. Now, many of us can maybe be able to relate to this. There's also a lot of their offspring that never leave. And these, you only hope that when this happens that we can call them helpers. And so... And so numerous of these older um, offspring will hang around to help and not actually go off and start their own nests. And there's some interesting sort of discussion as to what is the advantage of this. Um, but imagine this. This is a whole big collection of a single family, all collectively helping with raising of offspring and siblings. Okay. So the next time we're sitting at commencement, I hope you'll take a moment to look up into these trees above us and think about these acorn woodpeckers, and we will hear them all over the place. So keep an ear out for them. Okay. Now, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the groundskeeping crew on this. On this. <laughs> yeah. They are some of the hardest working people that I know, and they're always pleasant, they're always helpful, and they, they work like crazy to maintain this beautiful campus. And I just want to send a thank you to them because every time I walk across campus, because this is so beautiful, this place brings me joy. And, it, and it's because of their efforts. So, and I, it, if, and I, don't, I know some, some can't be here, but if, if any of these folks are here, I, I'd actually ask you to stand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to end on this, why nature matters. So this is a view from Pepperwood Preserve. 
which is uh, located northeast of Santa Rosa, uh, about 13, 14 driving miles. Uh, beautiful place, one of the most beautiful views in all of the East County. Now, we can talk about services that are provided by having healthy ecosystems. And I'm not gonna spend time going through all of these, but they're numerous. But just for example, for some of the three systems that we've talked about, the giant kelp and the kelp beds off our coast are some of the more productive biological systems on the planet. And these provide essential foundations for many of our local fisheries, either directly or indirectly. So we can think of the economic basis of many of our coastal communities are linked to the health of these systems. The giant coastal redwoods. These are recorded to be the fastest growing organisms, or plants at least, on the planet, producing more plant material in a year than any other um, organism that we've studied. And what this involves is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it into wood. And this is a long-term storage. And so having these healthy systems is one of the potential tools that we can use to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it into biological forms for long periods of time. The oak woodlands and the grasslands of our hills help regulate water movement through these ecosystems. They help store that water and slowly release it, which is important for our agriculture in this region as well as supplying um, drinking water. But it even goes beyond these sorts of services, these economic services. There seems to be kind of an explosion of studies right now that are looking at the health benefits of being in nature. And so I saw this on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago. I'm like, I have to get that in my, my talk. And this was actually a study currently being done by the University of Louisville uh, Medical School. And what they're looking at is the health benefits of having trees in neighborhoods. Because one of the trends that they've been seeing is that in more impoverished neighborhoods, they're seeing trees uh, being lost as they age and die, but those communities don't have the resources to replant those trees. And they're seeing a disparity in health effects of that, potentially. And so they're doing this large-scale study where they're actually going into these neighborhoods and planting trees in some areas, but not in others, to do a kind of a controlled study. And what they're interested in, in, in testing is, do these trees improve air quality, and if so, Will that improve cardiovascular function? Another study that I came upon, or actually, I'm sorry, there's other health benefits that they, they've actually suggested in this study. That that's the cooling effect that trees have. There's this, this, ur, uh, this um, urban heat effect that we have, that concrete kind of holds heat and radiates that heat back out. But if we can provide more shaded spaces, this creates cooler environments, and cooler environments will encourage more people to spend more time being active outside. And being active outside can lead to decreases in various health conditions like diabetes, obesity, stress, and anxiety. There's other studies that are showing that being in nature can improve our mental health. And so this was a study that came out a couple years ago, and, it's, and the findings of this was that individuals that spend 90 minutes walking in nature have significant reduction in rumination, this idea of kind of dwelling on negative, kind of dark thoughts that are associated with depression. And there's a part of the brain that they, they think that this is coming from, the subgenial prefrontal cortex. And they've shown that after a 90-minute walk, there's significant decreased activity in this region of the brain, indicating that there's an actual physiological effect of this. Oops, Oops. I'm sorry. So, the New York Times kind of reported this study, and I, I, I appreciated the editor's note, especially the end. So, here we are again at Pepperwood. I, I take my classes up to Pepperwood, and one of the things that I always try to, to save time for is having my students just sit quietly for 20 to 30 minutes, turn off their phone, no conversation, just sit and be present, and listen, and look, and feel. Now, we don't have 20 minutes, <laughs> but I would ask you to just watch. I, what, this is just, I did a quick recording. It's a minute long. We'll hear 
bird calls, we'll hear insects, we'll hear grasses rustling. I can't tell you how many times I watched this in preparing this talk. <laughs> it's like, oh, I think I need to watch that video again. <laughs> okay, so. So nature is important. It's important economically. It's important for our, our physical and mental health. But one of the other things that I've come to appreciate is that it gives us a sense of place. When I go out to the coast, when I'm in the tide pools, when I go to the mountains, I feel a connection with my parents. And I feel a connection with my children. It creates a common place that we can then unify around. Now, we are experiencing a period of rapid change. There are, we are monitoring ecosystems and it tells us that things are changing. Which is why it is so important that we spend time outside because we can't really appreciate what's being lost if we don't know what is currently out there. And we need to be able to document this change. We need to be able to communicate it to others. Because ultimately in the end, what it comes down to is we protect what we love. So I wanna end playing a little song for you. you. I'm sure you all know it. Feel free to sing along. I will not. <laughs> and um, it's one of the first songs that I think I learned how to sing. It was on a 1970 Sesame Street album. And I find that when I'm really stressed, it helps calm me. And it helps me to kind of see things in a different way, to refocus on what I think is important. And I'm also going to play kind of a, a, I mean, we're going to flip through a bunch of photos, all from on campus or closely around campus. Most of these were taken this last weekend by my daughters as we walked around campus just looking at things. Um, I will just, there's a disclaimer, there are a couple photos that we did not take, but we did see these things. <laughs> okay, so, um, and this is where I'll end it. So I just want to end by, by thanking you all for giving me this hour to share with you, to hopefully convey to you some of the things that I love, and hopefully this will change the way that you see things in this county and appreciate how fortunate we are to live in such a beautiful place. So I will end it with this. Slow down, you move too fast. You got to make the morning last. Just kicking down the cobblestones. Looking for fun and feeling groovy. Hello, lamppost, what you know when? I've come to watch your flowers growing. Ain't you got no rhymes for me? Do do do, do feeling groovy. Dappled and drowsy and ready to sleep 
and go morning time drop all his petals on me. Life, I love you. All is groovy. Thank you. 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 Thanks. Well, this is very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Thanks for being here. Thank you.